Testing, one, two, three. Hello, I'm Mahesh Saptarishi, the host of Mic Drop, a podcast where we explore what makes innovators tick. There is no template that guarantees innovation, yet there are some patterns. Without tenacity, you will likely give up too soon. Without being inspired and without the ability to inspire others, you won't have the strength of a community. Without being creative, you'll not be able to break from the status quo. Without being knowledgeable, you'll not be able to identify consequential problems. Innovators, almost without exception, are tenacious, inspiring, creative, and knowledgeable. This is what makes innovators tick, leading to that mic drop moment. The purpose of this podcast is to learn and make that mic drop moment more likely for the each of us. Thank you and enjoy. When there's a button that's labeled, don't press this, my nature is to go press it and see <laughs> what happens. Yeah. Because if, you're, if you just tell me don't press it and you're not telling me why I shouldn't press it, then I want to understand what happens when I do press it. Today, I'm talking to Sammy Kamkar, co-founder of OpenPath. Sammy is an incredibly creative, curious, smart, and humble person, and a dog lover to boot. Uh, <laughs> Sammy's probably one of the few, if not, I don't know, maybe the only person that I know at Motorola with a Wikipedia page dedicated to him. And, I, and I've been really looking forward to this conversation for a really long time. So we'll get awesome. right into it. Hey, Sammy. Hey, Mahesh. Great to chat. So, Sammy, we're going to start from the very beginning, the very beginning of time. So where were you born? I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I think you were there for a bit. I was. So yeah, my parents came to the U.S. My mom was from Iran. My dad's from Dubai. And they had arranged marriage over there. They came to the U.S. pretty young to go to school at the University of Pittsburgh. And that's where I was born. And then kind of my mom raised me out there. And she was at some point, my dad had gone back to Dubai. And my mom was always in the university. She was like always in school and always working. So she would just kind of take me to her university because she couldn't get a sitter. And she had friends, you know, I guess you have friends at university. So she would drop me off with one of her friends who worked at the library. That was a big, one of these big libraries. So they had computers, which is really cool. And this is, let's see. I'm 37. So this is, I, I was, this was like early nineties and they had the internet, right? They were, they were at school. So that was pretty cool. And they basically put me on a computer and I got to play with browsers. I mean, I don't even remember if it was maybe Mosaic back then, but I remember maybe I played with that like briefly before something like Netscape came out or <laughs> I forget what else, but I also remember the terminal and being able to do things like gopher and, and finger and just being able to talk to other people on a on a system <laughs> oh geez <laughs> what kind of machine did you play with at the library and what was it that you used at home i remember my mom bringing like she one day she was able to afford a computer probably on credit cards and brought a computer back home and i was probably nine or ten years old and that was like the coolest day of my life that was like yeah we had a computer i can now kind of do whatever i want I don't have to worry. There's no like restrictions on it. And we were able to dial up into the university. So I was able to use that ISP at the time. Yeah. And that was, I feel like it was a Packard Bell, maybe. I think it was a <laughs> Packard Bell. I figured it was like 386 or 486. I was Windows 95. So it was 46. Sure. And yeah, immediately I kind of, you know, I'd already used the internet a little bit. So I started browsing and that was kind of the day I found IRC. So I downloaded an IRC client and IRC, I believe. That guy, Khaled, asking for 15 bucks. I'm like, sorry, dude, I don't have 15 bucks. I'm just going to wait the three seconds and hit, you know, demo mode. <laughs> and I went onto a server and then joined the channel. And I just said, hey, who wants to chat about the X-Files? And I was like, this is so exciting. I can just chat with people. Because I think before then I was on message boards. And I'd post mm -hmm. a message and I just have to wait. Yeah. And usually I wouldn't hear from anyone until like the next time I could go back to the library. So this was really exciting. Yeah. Because I didn't even know chat existed. This was actually new. So it's kind of refreshing on a message board. And yeah. I, I went into the chat room and, and I said that and someone, I'm like, who wants to chat about the X-Files? And someone responds immediately and just says, get out. And I'm like, well, that's a 
we don't have to chat about X-Files. We can chat about whatever else you want. Yeah. Tell me what your favorite TV show is. And they, this person says, you have 10 seconds to get out of the chat room. And I say, oh, okay. And I thought about it. And my mom would always say, don't ever tell anyone your name on the internet. Don't let yeah. them know where you live. So I'm like, well, this guy, this person doesn't know anything about me. So no, All right, I'm behind the keyboard and monitor. So I'm, I'm safe. And 10 seconds later, that brand new computer that my mom bought for me crashed. I got this blue screen and I, well, I was freaking out. Like, I'm, like I, have no idea, I have no idea what to do. I pulled all the power cords out of the monitor. I didn't quite realize that. I didn't know the difference between the monitor and the computer. <laughs> I think I figured out there were some other cords too. I pulled those out too. So there were no lights on anything. And then I just waited. I'm like, the longer I wait, the better it'll probably be. I waited half an hour and I plugged everything back in and everything came back up. And I was still like, I was kind of terrified, but I was also like, that's the coolest thing ever. How do I do that? <laughs> and I just, I just needed to know, like, I just had, I just became purely obsessed with what that was and how can I do that? And how can I protect against that? And not that I'm malicious, I don't want to take people's computers down, but there is something really intoxicating about being able to control something, I think in a manner that, that is not expected or, or use the system in a way that is was not intended. I just think it's super magical. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, going into an IRC channel and being there and so you're not supposed to be there and you're being <laughs> asked to be, people are asking you to leave, but that's kind of like the same effect as like getting into some of these systems and in some interesting ways. I think that's, you're right. And there's, there's something about exploring what is almost a bit forbidden. Yeah, exactly. It's a puzzle. You gain access that you didn't have before and it's nice. Sure. It just feels good. Yeah to have something new or something, something different. I think that's just so, that's kind of interesting. But there's also like, I think this, this notion that wh why do people not want to include you in a conversation, right? It's mm -hmm. like, it, there's, maybe it's FOMO of sorts, but uh, it, it, like, I use this example sometimes with my family and such, but it's like when there's a button that's labeled, don't press this, my nature is to go press it and see <laughs> what happens yeah. because if you if you just tell me don't press it and you're not telling me why I shouldn't press it then I want to understand what happens when I do press it right yeah, so yeah. so Pittsburgh how long were you there to what age yeah. were you in Pittsburgh I think I was there till 13 and then my mom I think she watched a lot of movies and TV and always saw LA and was like do you want to move to LA like you yeah. can just get in the car and go like and we moved around Pittsburgh a lot so yeah I didn't quite have any home base. I didn't really feel like there was any home for me. I probably moved every two or three years. So it wasn't a big, just seemed like, okay, we're probably going to move anyway. So might as well try this new place. So got in her car and drove out to LA. So yeah, 13. And then in LA, started going to high school. So I think it was ninth grade. And I mean, it was around that time I started playing Counter-Strike. So I was getting, I had started doing a bunch of programming I went to like a couple conferences actually at CMU, some programming conferences and Pearl, Pearl Pro, Pearl conferences as well. But this is like when you were what, 12 years old or 11 years old? You were doing yeah, Pearl so conferences? Think, <laughs> yeah. So I think maybe when I was 12 was probably the first one. It was called yet yeah. another Pearl conference at CMU. And I was writing code. Like I had started learning Pearl. I think it was because I saw, I don't know, I wanted to learn how to code. Like that seemed like a thing that was help beneficial if you wanted to be a hacker. So I had some friends in high school and we'd play Counter-Strike all the time. Yeah. And I just remember playing Counter-Strike. And one day I, I finally had like spe two speakers, mm -hmm. so two little desktop speakers. And I remember someone, I would hear someone walking and I didn't see them on my screen. So they're behind me, but I heard their footsteps and I heard the footsteps panning from my right speaker to my left speaker. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like I can tell, like my mind can tell that they're on the right side and now they're closer to the left side. I don't see them in my heads up display in the software. So that means they're an enemy. So you see your teammates in the display, but I'm like, well, my computer knows kind of my computer must know where they are. Like it wouldn't know how to play that sound. And even if it didn't know, it could, I could, I should be able to convert that sound to a position of some sort. So I started learning about this sort of intercepting DLL. So sort of being a man in the middle between your program that's then pull, uh, accessing some DLL library. And I started writing software, well, really cheap software for Counter-Strike. And this was a lot of fun. So I was learning, sort of manipulating binaries and then disassembly and debugging third-party binaries when you don't have source code. So I sort of continued doing that. And it was like, at some point I made 
all of these improvements, all of my zooms, I could see the full screen instead of having like a little scope where you can only see through a, a circular scope. I added zoom to every single gun. So it doesn't matter what you have. You have excellent zoom that you can go in and out. And then footsteps, I would just show them on the display so I could actually see where all the enemies were. Uh, and then it became, you know, the game wasn't, it was really fun for about five minutes and then it wasn't fun anymore. It's like, it's not actually <laughs> fun, but there's no challenge. So yeah, now yeah. I'm like, I'm actually really bored. This isn't fun. And I have a few weeks go by. And finally, this, this program call, comes out called Punk Buster. And it's specifically to prevent cheats, uh, cheat software from running. And I would release my cheat software on my website as open source. And I was like, I wonder if it stops mine. And it did. I was like, oh, wow. And all of a sudden, this became a game again for me. It wasn't necessarily that I wanted to cheat. I just wanted the cheat software to work. So at this point, my mom was always working. She wasn't there. She wasn't at home much. So I just stopped going to school. I was like, I'm just going to focus on this because I need to get this working again. <laughs> and that was really fun. Like I would come out with a new version and I put, I publish it and I publish a source. And a few days later, they would come out with a new version that stopped my update. And we kind of went back and forth and it was, it was just a lot of fun. Like it was, I think we were sort of, I don't know, felt like we were helping each other in some ways and it was just cat and mouse. And I think I learned a lot in that really brief period of time working sort of against these people and they're working against me, but I felt like we were both sort of increasing our capabilities and understanding, you know, how can you hide from the system? And so that was a lot of fun until my mom came home one day and was like, wait, aren't you, aren't you in school? Like, <laughs> I explained to her, no, I actually stopped going. And she came early, she came home early because she had lost her job. So she's like, well, you need to pay rent. And I was like, oh, okay. So I started looking for jobs, you know, filling out, filling out things at like Starbucks and the local grocery store. And I got an email, I mean, probably that week, like very, very fortunate. And someone said, hey, we saw your cheat software. Do you want to write software for us, for this company in San Diego? And that blew my mind. I was like, wait, people will pay you money to write software? I said, no clue. And I said, sure. So, you know, I, I started consulting, sort of, sort of just writing software for them remotely. They didn't know my age. They didn't know anything about me, just that I could do it. And then one day, they, a few, I don't know, maybe a few months in, they said, do you want to work full time down in San Diego? And I said, absolutely. They, and then I just drove down. I was like 15 years old. I didn't even have a car. So I think I took the Amtrak down initially and I said, Hey guys, what's up? And they're like, what are, I don't, we don't even know if we can hire you. We don't know if that's legal. And like, well, this is okay. I have a, I have a work permit for my school, which I totally made up. I just like printed out something that I knew you, you kind of needed a work permit when you were younger. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, nothing's bad is really happening. Right. So I, I didn't feel any. <laughs> I didn't feel like that was crossing any boundaries. And they said, okay. And that's when I started working this company down in San Diego uh, programming. And so like, you know, at 15, you're, you're, you're proficient enough to, to write some of these, I would say, fairly advanced pieces of software to defeat sort of these different things in the game. And there are people actively trying to figure out how to make sure that your cheats don't work, et cetera. Yep. How were you learning? Were there online chats? Were there resources that you were tapping into? How are you teaching yourself? Yeah, good question. It, it wasn't like it is today. So there was one website. So, you know, there's the Frack magazine and like there were a couple really good, art, there were a couple of good articles in there. A lot of it was, I'd say, just trial and error. And I think it's also playing both. I think maybe what's been beneficial, most beneficial to me, if it's one thing, is trying to play both sides. I find maybe a lot of people who might be engineers, like, let's say they're software engineers, they're not looking at that other side, maybe the reverse engineering side. And I know a lot of reverse engineers, and most of them aren't writing production software. So I think trying to do both. Like a lot of thing, things that I would do when I was younger, I was like, oh, this is a really cool tool, like Nmap, a, a port scan. I was like, this is really cool. I want to make my own version. Actually, the first thing I did was, I think it's still online somewhere, but I like TCP dump, this packet sniffer. And so I made a TCP dump. I was like, I, I like TCP dump, but I want color in the output. It doesn't, it doesn't even colorize output today. I want colorized output, so I'll write my own. And then I was like, oh, it depends on this library called libpcap. I don't want to use the library. I actually want to... I want to write, write my own library that actually talks to whatever raw socket mechanism is available based off whatever operating system. So then doing that. So like I just learned by implementing stuff sort of down the stack, how it all worked. And then with my interest in reversing and, and exploitation, then I'm like, oh, I just made this mistake that I shouldn't have. I wonder who else makes this mistake. 
there are probably other people who are doing the same mistake that I made because this just seems the easiest way to implement it. And I think actually doing the, the programming side made it really easy for me to identify I'm lazy. Like I want, I want the output, right? I want to get to the end as quickly as possible. So I might take some shortcuts and now I see, oh, that's totally a problem that could be exploited by someone. I bet other people have taken those same exact shortcuts, which is kind of interesting is that people are very similar. So yeah, I mean, the learning was really just a trial and error. So a lot of it was I'll write some code, I'll compile it, and then I'll throw it in a debugger or disassembler and then try to see how it behaves. And then you start getting used to it. I was, were there any chat channels or others? Like, did you have any benefit from a community that you could tap into? The community, I'd say I started getting involved in a community around age of 14 or 15. I was already writing a lot of software, but I had found people on IRC. So there was a group called San Diego 2600. So there's this 2600 magazine, kind of like a hacker magazine. And there are regional groups just run by random people. Got it. Got it. Okay, Um, so now... Yeah, and I guess one other thing is that I learned a lot from also just open source. So going to that first Pearl conference I went to, they handed me, they had CDs of FreeBSD. So I came home and then I took my mom's computer and I installed FreeBSD on it from Windows 98 at this point. And I couldn't get X Windows, the, you know, the GUI to work. So it was now just a permanent console. Like the whole thing was just a black screen. And I just had to move to the links to the term, to the text-based browser. And my mom was pissed. She's like, what? I can't use this anymore. I was like, mom, it's fine. You just use L-Y-N-X or L-I-N-K-S, these two browsers. And it's, it's just no images. That's all. <laughs> Funny. So, so you're, you know, this, this company from San Diego calls you up and says, hey, mm-hmm. be, be a developer. You've convinced them that you're, you can work and do all that. So what kind of stuff did you do for, for this company? Yeah, so they were a top level domain. So if you're from like .com, .net, they were yep. .ws and they branded as website. And this was early, early internet where there were only a handful of domains you could actually, or TLDs you could actually buy. And they had done really well branding themselves as a website. It was a small company, maybe 10, 15 people at the time. So I was, yeah, writing software. Then I was taking over, then at some point I took over all, I became their sysadmin as well. So I took over all the name servers, which ran all the who is traffic, all the actual DNS traffic. And I was really interested in DNS too. That's so cool. That was really <laughs> cool. Were you kind of more or less working by yourself at this company? Did you, were you part there were of, a couple of pro- There were a couple of programmers, but I, I was doing most of the projects myself. And I was just also really curious to learn about, yeah, you know, uh, about things. Actually, I remember a, a buddy of so someone started working there. His name is Will Red, and we became really good friends. He was also an engineer there. And then I think later on, we both moved to LA and became roommates. And then he founded a zip recruiter, which, which was kind of cool. So they're a pr- pretty big company uh, these days. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we used to work together back when we were, we were younger and, and then lived together once we moved to LA. So yeah, I was working there for maybe two, two years. And then I was able to, I was making better and better money. I was like, very super fortunate. I was able to support my mom. And uh, yeah, one day I got a call from someone in LA. He's like, Hey, you know, I heard about you. I saw some of your software online. Do you want to, do you want to like quit your job and not make any money and sleep on my couch and start a company? And I was like, that sounds terrible. No. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he's like, okay, well, what do you want to do with your life? And this is over the phone. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's a really good indirect question. I mean, no one's ever asked me that. I never even thought of it. I never even thought of like, what do I want to do with my life? And I was like, thinking about this, I'm probably 17 years old at this time. And I'm like, you know what? It would be cool to start a company. I would like to learn how to actually start a, like a, a startup. Whether it's successful or not, I'm sure I could learn something there. And he responds. He says, okay, well, my last company I started was, was a web, web hosting company for Trellis. I sold it for $30 million cash. So why don't you Come with me, be my co-founder, my tech technical co-founder, and we can, you know, we can start this and you can learn, learn from me. And I was like, you know, I'm probably not going to get that opportunity again. I should take this. Thanks for helping me get my presentation ready. You really pulled through on that last project. Well done. Thank you so much for helping get things done on short notice. I really appreciate you. Great job as always. When you want to thank a coworker for going above and beyond, don't just send them a chat, 
take an extra moment to send them a virtual high five. The Motorola Solutions High Five program sends a message of thanks to the employee and lets their manager know of what a great team player they are. Even better, every fifth high five translates into a cash reward. The best way to show appreciation is with a high five. Send one today. So maybe let's rewind a little bit. So sure. Finality was that company that that you went to after San Diego, right? Right, um, right. And so you were there for six, six years or, or so. Now, yeah. you did some interesting things while, I think, around sure. that time, sure. which I was reading an article recently, and I think it was a, there was one on Business Insider, and they referred to you as a legendary hacker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so, so I think I think I think you should give a little bit of the story there. Sure, sure. Okay. So, yeah, we started growing this company. You know, I started when I was seventeen. Maybe it was around nine. I was nineteen. We we're a little bigger, maybe twenty or thirty employees. I had an office in Culver City, and I remember at the time it was two thousand five. At the time, a lot of my like younger friends, younger as in my like my age at the time, had. MySpace profiles. And I had sort of been resistant and finally I was like, all right, I'll, I'll make a profile, see what this, this website's about. And I didn't realize it, but at the time it was the number one website on the internet. The number two website on the internet was Google. <laughs> so a lot of people were on this MySpace website and it's just a social network like Facebook that allowed a lot of control over your profile. So you could have your own CSS, but they blocked executing things like JavaScript or Flash, you know, back when you had Flash or Java applets. So I was like looking around and I thought it was pretty neat. So I made a profile, uploaded some photos. I found, oh, it kind of restricted. You can only upload 12 photos. It's like, can I upload a 13th photo? It's like, yeah, it was just client side restriction. You could still do a call to their, to their back end. I was like, what else could I do? And I remember it said a relation had like a relationship status drop down, like single, married, whatever. And mine was in a relationship. And I wanted to say in a hot relationship, which it wasn't a text input. It was just a drop down. So I couldn't really set it and it was all numeric like the actual values you're sending are one two three four so i started playing around like is there a way i can execute javascript and maybe i can modify the page the, the dom no that that wasn't working they would like strip out words like javascript and i just kept playing around I, I thought well maybe instead of trying to mess with them let me mess with the browsers maybe i can execute javascript in a way that a browser shouldn't execute it but it does and i wrote a fuzzer to uh, test against the browsers at the time, like Firefox, Chrome, uh, Safari, uh, Internet Explorer. And I found that I could sort of break up a script tag into like, it was like SCR and IPT on two lines. So that wasn't valid, but it worked across all browsers. And that also then bypassed any, any filters on MySpace's side. So it was just very loose interpretation of the HTML spec. At that point, then I just had to get past a bunch of other things, but I realized, yeah, I can now modify the DOM and I can say in a hot relationship. It's like, that's kind of funny. It's just a subtle change. And I thought, well, if I can now modify the page and I'm executing code as the user, well, that also means if I do any sort of, if I put an iframe in or something like that, I'll be executing requests as the user using their cookies. So I could actually make them add me as a friend if we're not already friends. So I added that and I thought that was kind of funny. And then I was like, well, what else could I do? I could actually make them update their own profile. There was a CSRF token that would prevent you from doing an attack like this, but I could also just pull the CRS. So I could like, because I'm running it in their domain, I'm like, I'm updating their own profile on the myspace.com domain. I could then pull the token, extract it myself, like running in their browser and then send, send an update and update their profile. And I would just add at the bottom of the profile, but most of all, Sammy is my hero. And I just thought that was funny. A few people might add me over the next week or month and I can show off to some of my geek friends and someone will complain and they'll remove it. And I waited, I don't know, maybe a few days, maybe less. I was probably impatient. And I was like, man, it's not, no one's adding me. No one's visiting my profile. So no one's hitting it. So no one's even getting it. Like, well, this sucks. How do I get, how do I get more people to visit my profile? I thought, okay, well, if I can make you update your profile, if you visit my profile, I can make you add me as a friend and add me as a hero, I can also just add the code to your profile. So if someone visits your profile, they will add me as a friend, add me as a hero and add the code to their profile. And then I should at least have, I don't know, at least a dozen people should get added over the next week or so. So I tried it out. I, I launched it one night, kind of didn't really know if it worked or there's no, I had no test bed, right? I just had, had, to, had to write it and see if it works or not. And I 
uh, pushed it out to my profile. And the next morning I woke up and I said, oh, I have new friends. And I looked and I had 10,000 new friends. <laughs> And I realized I just made a horrible mistake. And I guess technically this is a virus. It was a worm. Yeah. It's spreading without any user interaction. And I also realized I don't really have a way to remove it. Like if, if you have a cold and you sneeze on someone, it doesn't matter if you're better the next day, right? You've yeah. already spread it. And I freaked out because I also realized Fox had just acquired my space for $400 million. And I'm like, oh, like that's a big... You know, to me, it was just kind of a website that you play around with, not like some big company. Sure. And I didn't know what to do. So I just, I mean, I didn't really do anything. I just kind of sat around, just kind of refreshing and seeing how fast is it moving. Oh, I did send MySpace a, an email anonymously. And I was like, hey, I uh, pretended to be somebody who got infected with it. And I said, hey, there's this person on my profile. It says their name's Sammy. I, I don't know, like how they how <laughs> it works but like he added himself to my profile it seems like there's this weird code and i had to obfuscate it and make it very very small because there was a just a byte count limit so getting within the byte count i had to really compress everything so i was just saying well i'm not really sure how it works but like it looks like this compressed code is really doing this and i just gave it super detailed explanation of exactly how it operated. And like, I think this is the easiest way that you can prevent this, you know, in its tracks, just like block this one function. I think it was like an eval or something like just, if you just block the word eval, you'll be good. Good luck. And I sent that you know, <laughs> quote, quote anonymously and I hope they had received it. And I kind of went to work, I drove to work and I just kind of was just scared. I was just like white, you know, I felt like I couldn't do anything. And my mind was just on this thing. And throughout the day, it just went from 10,000 to 100,000. I drove home, it was a million, over a million people added. And it, even if you delete me or you delete, it, as soon as you, you delete me, and then it would take you back to your profile, which re-executed the code, which re-added. So it wasn't, not intentionally, it just like, that's just how it ended up yeah. based off how it was designed. And at around a million, a little over a million, I'm refreshing to see how fast it's moving. And I see, oh, okay, it's going like 3,000 people per second. 3,000, 3,000, and then the prof my profile's down. I was like, oh, okay, I'm glad. Maybe 20 hours since I launched it. And they took my profile down. So I was glad to hear that. So then I was like, I wonder if it still says Sammy's my hero on other profiles. So I went to somebody else's profile and it says, this profile is also down. <laughs> I was like, oh no. I went to myspace.com and said, the website is down. Everyone here is working on it. And I was like, oh no. And I felt absolutely awful. I was like... I had a company. I know what it's like for servers to go down. That's never a good feeling. I would never want to do that to anyone. There was no, obviously no intention, <laughs> intentional malice. I was trying to put Sammy's my hero on pro people's profiles. So I felt really bad. And I was like, what do I do? Should I drive over? Because I, I know they were somewhere in Los Angeles and I was in LA. I was like, like should I come over with coffee and donuts and you know, apologize? Hey guys, I'm Sammy. I'm sorry. Can I like help you with some SQL queries or something? Or I don't know thought that might be a bad idea to just show up unannounced. So I just kind of waited around to see what would happen. But like the internet police going to come? I, I have no idea. So a day goes by, a week goes by, three months, four months. And I'm like, oh, okay. After a couple months, I'm like, I'm good. I'm in the clear. I'm glad nothing bad happened out of that. You know, they recovered. Like they immediately recovered. They just I killed it and brought the site back up. It's like, okay, well, I'm not doing anything like that again. And now it's like six months later and the company's, com my company's doing well. My, I buy a new car and I walk down to my car one day and there's two guys standing next to my car and I realize, oh no, I'm getting carjacked. And two more guys come up to me and they say, Sammy? And I'm like, oh, you know, carjackers don't know your name. And they're like, Sammy, we have a search warrant for you. And I was like, what? And they all show me badges. So it's Electronics Crime Task Force, Secret Service, LADA, and I think the CHP and maybe LAPD. <laughs> and I watched a lot of TV, so I saw like on 24, there was like, show me the search warrant. So I was like, show me the search warrant. And they just hand, <laughs> handed this document to me. I'm like, oh, okay. So I started reading through, reading through, reading through. And then I finally see MySpace mentioned. I was like, okay, so I know what this is about. Uh, I was like, all right, let's go go ahead and do your search. And they're like, oh, we're already doing it. I was like, oh, okay. So we go upstairs and there's a dozen agents with guns in my in my apartment going through everything. Actually, this is where I was living with Will from ZipRecruiter. So they actually, actually it's very funny. So I heard from him after that, he was outside the apartment in his towel naked. So they had busted <laughs> in while he was in his shower getting ready for work. Yeah, he was I think, working at a different company. I don't think ZipRecruiter he had started yet. And at, my girlfriend at the time was also there and she was in like my bed sheets. She was in my bed. So she was in bed sheets or whatever. And they just like busted in. 
And they just started going through everything and taking everything that had data on it. So computer, laptop, iPod. And then I read the rest of the warrant and it said there will also be at this other address. And that was my company address. So finality. I was like, oh no, you guys are going to be there too. And they're like, we're already there. I was like, oh no. And I realized, you know, we were a, we were a voice over IP PBX company, but all of our, like we had a bunch of stuff sort of co-located in our office. So if they took our servers, that would shut down our business. All of our customers' systems would go down. So I think Chris, my co-founder at some point, I think they came in and said, what does Sammy have access to? And they're like, everything. And they're like, all right, guys, take everything. And I don't know what he did, but he somehow convinced them that I was just like an intern and I just got coffee. So they just finally, he convinced them to only take my computer and my phone and nothing else. But at my place, they took everything and then they left. So I got, I was 19 at the time. I didn't really know what to do. I called an attorney and then I found that, you know, it was interesting. It was actually, it wasn't even my space that came after me. So it could have been civil and totally reasonable, but it was actually the U.S. government that came after me, or it was really the state, the state of California that said, hey, this is like a computer crime. And I think it was also, it was the first demonstration of this. It was a new type of attack. Like no one had ever seen a virus that mm. was self-propagating through the web. And it's also, I think to date, the fastest virus, spreading virus of all time. And I think that's also just scary because it could have been something else. I could have easily just grabbed your cookies for your bank or something like that. So I think that was just interesting and I went back and forth with the DA over maybe another six months and finally came to terms and I took a plea agreement and the agreement was I would not be able to touch a computer or the internet for the rest of my life. That was a big problem for me because I had no high school diploma. I had supporting my mom. So the agreement came down to, well, I would go, I'd be a probation, do a bunch of community service, pay some restitution. But if... My probation, if I was on good behavior for three or four years, then I could go back to the judge and I could request to get everything removed and lifted. And I thought, I thought that was reasonable. I could do that. Like, I'm not intending to do anything like that again anyway. But it does mean no computer or internet use for a couple of years. So I was like, well, I mean, that's the price you pay. So that's the price I pay. So, so be it. So I agreed to that. And maybe four years later, I went back to the judge. My probation officer said I was her favorite client and I, everything got lifted. And I was 100% back to a normal person, able to get a computer again. And I think, you know, when we talked last, one of the things you said was just being away from the computer was actually something that helped you and you got something out of it as well. So, yeah. you know, how did you, how did you use that time to, to continue learning, to continue developing yourself? Yeah, I think it, I think it was really good for me. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad it happened. I mean, I'm not glad I like took down my space. That wasn't my intention. But I'm glad that I was restricted and I had that change in my life. Because for one, I was just, I mean, super introverted. I was just always on the computer, so just very little generally social interaction. So I think that forced me to go out and do other things. It forced me to actually have some social interaction. It got me interested in other things like reading, reading books, starting to go work out, like actually go to a gym. Uh, you know, I'd go outside and like, what is that bright light in the sky? Uh, <laughs> you know, instead of just having the, the curtains down all the time. So all of that, I think, was really was just a really helpful for me. And that was sort of I was nineteen, probably through twenty two, and then that, then I could drink, so I could go out to bars and you know be be more social. So I think that that was just a nice. Uh, a, I think I'd just be a very different person had that not had that not occurred, and I think it also removed a lot of my maybe dependence mm -hmm. on computers. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I still love technology. I think all sorts of things are all sorts of systems are interesting, but it also means there are other interesting things out there. I think that's pretty cool, for sure. Come on down to the SMVC Virtual Hackathon Center, where we have everything you need to skill up and get your hack on. Whether it's products, DevOps, bug smashes, Q&A, marketing, visual design, UX, or just brainstorming. It has never been easier to find a team, participate, or even to host your own hackathon. Yay! Find it on the SMVC Bat Chat page. Get in there and check it out. Oh, yeah. I feel a hack attack coming on. So let's fast forward a little bit. You found co-founded OpenPath with James and Alex, and yeah, and, yeah, and also Rob Peters, our CTO. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And so, but you guys didn't start with physical access control as the goal, right? That, yeah. that was a that was a journey. 
Yeah, that was a journey. And, you know, it's, it's, I, I feel like a lot of startups are like that. In fact, the first startup was Phonality, that, that voice RVP one. That was actually, we were competing with Vonage. So we were resident, it was sort of consumer play. And we only had a couple hundred customers and we had so many issues that we had to get a phone system to support all the support calls. And we're like, well, we can just build a phone system. We kind of already did that. So we built a phone system and realized, oh, we should just sell this. And that actually did well. So similarly, I think at, at OpenPath, we first started kicking around some ideas and we were initially a firewall in the cloud. So you would send all of your traffic, your network traffic for business to the cloud, which seems kind of crazy, but as long as you're close by, like the, the delay is not noticeable. And then we sure. would filter everything and then send it back. And we started building this, probably went a year into it and realized, went to a conference like Black Hat, a security conference at Black Hat, and then realized, oh, wow, there's some other big companies with huge budgets that are doing this, like large public companies. They're going to crush us just with their marketing budgets alone. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? And one issue that we had as we're in different offices was with our RFID system, like our, these RFID cards that we're using. At one point, we lost one. That was a huge deal. They're really insecure. I was able to clone on them. I had written software for a penetration testing tool called Proxmark 3. It's written software I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago now that allows you to clone these, these badges. Yeah. And I tested it and it was the same exact technology, like literally hadn't yeah. changed. So I was very surprised about that. And there's also, I, I would have to let people, like if I had to let people in, we were also borrowing somebody's conference room. I'd have to go down 10 floors every time I wanted to let somebody in. It's like, I wish I could just do this for my phone. Sure. And we started thinking about that. Like, well, why can't we? Like, can we do that or can we make a, can we make up an app that does that and start looking at then we started playing with that and start trying to make an app and realize well we also have to make the hardware like if you want the experience to be really nice and really good then we have to make the hardware as well the reader and then we realized well if we want the reader to work really well we have to make the controller that unlocks the physical door that actually sends electricity through the, the electronic strike or maglock and we want it to be easy it should be sort of cloud-based and mobile and you shouldn't have to do any work. It's just tie it to your identity provider, Google or Okta or whomever, and you know, with one click, and everyone should just be added, and that's that. And you should never have to take your phone out of the out of your pocket either. Like that's another. I was like, why do I have to open an app and then unlock a door when I could I could just tape a card to my I could use, I could use scotch tape and tape a card to my phone and just pull it out and hit it. So we made a touchless experience where you just keep your phone in your in your pocket or bag or whatever, and you just wave at the reader and walk in, and it communicates wirelessly. But with with strong cryptography, that's how we started, and, and that just started growing and growing. It's it's kind of interesting that you know, like in many cases, uh, successful startups, not all, but I think in many cases, there comes a point where you realize that the hypothesis that you started out with is probably not going to bear out, and you kind yeah. of have to have a little bit of courage to pivot and do something different. I think I had to do that with my first company where. We started initially with the goal of building a better compression engine, a video compression engine. Oh, um, interesting. So it was applying computer vision to understand kind of where people, vehicles, other things were in video. And you would allocate a different number of bits per pixel for content that matters to, and a lower bits per pixel to stuff that perhaps was like the road or the tree or, or whatever else. So just so that there was some level of, content aware bit allocation. But we had to kind of put all that aside and decide, hey, we're not going to be successful in kind of redoing the MPEG-4 standard at that point in time and add value. We ended up going down security as, as a path forward. But no, it was also in the heels of 9-11. So there was, a, oh, uh, there, was, there was a desire there as well. So, but the, the point being that, you know, it looks sounds like with both finality and with with open path you guys had to make some sort of switch either a very substantial change in direction or at least a change in the business model yeah absolutely and, and i think another interesting thing for me that i just learned over that was ultimately the the things that did pan out were things that we actually had issues with where maybe initially we we're just trying to create a business because it's fun to build things yeah. and but ultimately pivoting to something that we actually had challenges with and we couldn't find a sure. great solution is always nice. Sure. Uh, so if you know that, let's start sure. with that first. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think like, as you were describing finality to me, I was like, oh shit, I wish I knew a little bit about what you guys did at that time, because, you know, at Broadreach, I was trying to figure out a way to have a low cost phone system 
for, mm. for our, our office. Yeah. And so I ended up downloading Asterix at that point, yeah. and we got Asterix working as a sort of a local on-prem PBX, which is, by the way, in retrospect, I spend most more time, I think, keeping Asterix up and alive than I actually yeah. did working to a certain extent, which is probably <laughs> not the right use of my time, but it was fun. Okay, so o- open path, kind of, you guys are doing your thing and, you know, a bunch of us who are outside the company are looking at open path and we're like, oh, these guys are actually doing something remarkably cool. And at that point in time, I think, you know, I, I came across you guys, but I was still at a Vigilon, Motorola about a Vigilon. And then we were tracking you guys at that point as well. And by, by all measures, you know, you were probably one of my favorite access control companies. And awesome. uh, we ended up, you know, buying, buying open path. So now you're kind of, you've been acquired and, uh, mm-hmm. and, and in many ways, I hate the word acquired because it, it almost indicates a one-way transfer of information when, when, it's, when it's not, right? It tends to be more of a marriage because if mm-hmm. you don't bring the entities together in a way where you can actually learn and there's an osmosis process perhaps where the best is something that percolates through everything that you're that you're doing as a larger organization, and hopefully the larger organization gives you some benefit in terms of scale and other things. So, the question in all of that rambling is, you know, how did you feel your journey as you were being acquired was, and and you know, how how do you feel the path from the point of acquisition to now has been? Yeah, I, th- I mean, I thought it was. Uh, the whole thing was very interesting. We had also heard about a Vigilon a lot. And that's, I think, I don't know who reached out to who, but I think it was first just trying to do an integration because we kept hearing about customers who would use it and really liked it and wanted the two to, to be combined. So then to hear about a potential acquisition, I think, you know, we're like, oh, do, do we want to do that or not? But the more we learned about Motorola and a Vigilon, the more we liked. And it was, I think another thing that was really important was just the person like just the personalities of people like it's i think uh at least all at open path the team is awesome like and i think that's just who you work with it has that's really important to me i want to work with people i like that people i can learn from and people just who are friendly and have good personalities so i think just talking to you know meeting more and more people everyone was also very similar and i I really like that so i was like okay that's cool I didn't really know what, what it would be like, especially joining such a large company relative to us, right? We're pretty small, I mean, barely, not even a hundred people. So I think once we joined, and I think there's something also really interesting about just seeing how MSI is continuously growing. So kind of, kind of seeing, you know, looking at that was really, was really cool. And for me, I think that's, for me, it's a huge learning experience because I want to learn how do you even, it's it's much easier to control a company when it's small, right? There's a lot less stuff you have to deal with. And how do you actually continue to grow something when it becomes larger and larger and larger? So just being able to see how some of those processes are implemented, I think that is kind of cool to me. And also seeing a company that can, that is this large, but still is continuing to build the product, I think is also pretty cool. So that was one of the things I was concerned with. I was like, I don't know what's really going to happen. Is this just going to become... Are we just going to become a sales organization and nothing's going to change with the product? And like, we're kind of like, you know, I feel like with a lot of acquisitions I've seen, it's almost like there's a code freeze and Mm -hmm. nothing changes with the product in other acquisitions I've seen from other companies. And that's not the case here. We are continuing to build stuff and we're, I think, oh, we're given that opportunity and with uh, like a lot of firepower, right? Because now we have other teams that we can work with. Actually, in fact, at uh, at uh, the Mike Saba conference where we where we got to meet each other, uh, we met each other for the first time. There was someone who was doing some cool like noise suppression stuff, and yeah. I saw that in the in the chat. And yeah. I reached out to him. and was like, "Hey, like we're yeah. doing, we have this intercom. Like, I yeah. bet we can use that." And yeah. I, I sent the software that uh, someone ch he, he shared yeah. with me, and yeah, yeah, we've already we're testing it right now, and it's yeah. awesome. It's like improving our system so much. Yeah. So, to have that kind of resource availability is it was it was such a cool experience yeah. to someone else to just be like here is something I've been working on you know all this yeah. time it makes this awesome you know it, if you have a loud noisy environment it gets rid of all that noise and all you hear is yeah. the voice and then we could take that and implement that and make our product better which helps everyone it helps the company I think 
having a sense of innovation or a sense of wanting to do something is you, you want to you, you want to take it forward in, in in a way that's that doesn't seem I don't know incomplete mm. is probably the word I would use but uh, there is there's a logical thread of exploration that when you go through that exploration you discover and I think it sounds like a lot that a lot of what you have done since your days learning Perl when you were a teenager going to CMU's conferences on <laughs> yeah. yet, yet another pearl, you proceeded through some sort of logical framework of just trying to understand and deconstruct. And you, and you said, as you said, it was very important for you to actually develop that knowledge set required to actually create uh, after that. Mm. So I don't know, I like my hats off to you because I think that there's, there's just a level of tenacity. There's a level of, I think, perseverance and curiosity that is required for you to actually make that exploration something that is truly fruitful. Oh, and, thanks. And, I've, I mean, I'll have to say I hit roadblocks all the time and I get frustrated very easily. And I found that my solution to that is to literally stop doing it and go do something else. And I'll switch projects. I'll literally switch yeah. projects and I won't go back to that. And it might be years, literally years later that I will return to that original project. And now I've worked on so many other things that yeah. I've learned enough that I can actually get past whatever roadblock. Yeah. So I'm maybe not as, you know, I, I know I have people in my life who are very dedicated and I'm like, yeah. I can't, I don't have your dedication. I wish I yeah. did. There's something yeah. I, I wish I could improve upon, but I've also learned that we have a lot of time in life. Like life is long. <laughs> so it's, so I found at least for myself, it's okay yeah. if I just skip. If I'm like, all right, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. I'm just going to like try something else now. And yeah. I come back to that. And I, yeah. oftentimes I come back to projects years later and I know yeah. just other, other areas of knowledge that helped me get past that roadblock that I hit, yeah. Um, yeah. which is kind of cool. So I don't know if there's any, anything helpful there. It's like, you can come back to things. Yeah. Um, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think I would say one of my biggest weaknesses has always been the, the inability to let go. And I mean, you sounds like a strike. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's a fine line between I think it being a strength and a weakness. But but to your point, some of the points in my life where I felt like okay, I actually had an epiphany of some sort that helped me solve a problem, is mm -hmm. when I was actually willing to take a step back and and you know not just take take a step back for a day or a couple hours, but really take a step back for maybe months. Okay. To, so there's something to it. There's clearly something to it. And maybe it is the brain processing stuff in the background and you don't even know it. Maybe there's acquired knowledge in between that helps you see things differently. Maybe there's something else. But for sure, I think the knowing when to, to take a step back and knowing when you perhaps have hit a brick wall and that the reason why you're not moving forward is because you have this thing in this this mental block in front of you that you can't get through given the tools that you have right now in your brain i, I think knowing that that knowledge is i think a bit critical otherwise mm -hmm. you 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 stall right yeah and, and in some way you you don't make the progress you want hey it's been like a great conversation but one of the things that i do want to sort of my last question probably or last topic area perhaps too premature to say it would be my last question. Mentoring. Do you get joy out of mentoring younger folks? Like you might have benefited a bit by people who gave you opportunities when you were when you were a teenager. You might have learned something from folks who spent time with you. How what do you do? Yeah, no, I, I think I think I learned a lot. I mean, I learned a lot from like the open source community. I learned a lot from conferences, like talks. Yeah. and people's write-ups. So I'd say primarily that's how I have, I mean, since I was a kid, I would try to do the same. I would just try to like, yeah. even if no one was looking at it, like I would still yeah. put it up because it is really, I think, you know, people would say GitHub, yeah. people are usually looking at things that have a lot of stars yeah. and there are so much amazing stuff with zero stars. Yeah. And I actually find that there are people who are making actually amazing tools, amazing software, libraries, whatever it may be, that have zero stars just because no one has looked at it and no yeah. one has maybe shared it or retweeted it or whatever it may be because everyone starts somewhere. And uh, it usually takes something, you know, for me, it was like going, you know, going to jail before people started looking at this, the projects that were released. And then they yeah. did look at the projects that were released. And I think, so I think there's a lot of people who are making really cool stuff. So I often look for those projects with few stars, but I'm 
whenever I'm working on things, I try to, when I can, I try to make things fully open and then I try to do yeah. write-ups. So just yeah. on my website, I'll have, yeah. and GitHub, I have a bunch of different open source, open hardware, yeah. and I do pretty detailed write-ups on how things work. So that's, I think, hopefully some, hopefully a few people can yeah. you know, learn from some of those. You're certainly one of the most curious, but it's not just curiosity. It is creativity that sits behind that curiosity where as you learn things through the process of exploring your curiosity, being able to convert that into things to try, that creative leap is something that is incredibly marvelous. And so I wish some of what you have in terms of that combination of curiosity and creativity, people can absorb as they learn from you and interact from you. Thank you for listening to Mic Drop. We would love to hear your thoughts on our podcast and your ideas for future episodes. Send us a note at micdrop at motorolasolutions.com. We promise to maybe read all your emails. And with that, I'm out.